<laughs> Even the moon is frightened of me. Frightened to death. The whole world is frightened to death. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Time Shifters podcast, still deep into spooky season. Uh, Tom, this has been a fun little series. It really has. And it's only going to get better, I think. We're, I, we're kind of come up on some fun films. <laughs> and, and I'm excited for tonight because admittedly, I, I haven't had a tremendous amount of experience with the Invisible Man stuff. So Yes, that's going to be very fun. cool because this was a first time watch for both films, though you knew some things about the original, right? Sort of. Uh, first time watch for the original, but yes, like, like any of the classics, I've seen bits and pieces of all of them. And, and I have actually seen the 2020. Uh, oh, okay, okay. My mistake. Man. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, before we get too deep into that, I did want to read a uh, message that was posted to our Facebook group from our friend Floyd, who uh, just finished listening to our Mummy episode. What did Floyd have to say? He says, I loved how Tom described the 1999 film as comforting. <laughs> Indeed it is. My wife puts it on every night because it helps her go to sleep. She calls <laughs> it her lullaby. <laughs> That is an interesting take. I don't know if I would consider that sleep material. <laughs> I know. I, that, I know. That feels like it's almost a backhanded uh, compliment there. It, kind of, unless she am, just... Am I boring? Am I boring you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, although I have a tendency to fall asleep to comedy specials. So uh, sometimes there's something about the voice that's talking to you. Maybe Brendan Fraser just puts her in a nice calm he is dreamy. He is. Uh, he goes on to say that uh, one of his favorite scenes in that film is the one where Evelyn asks, by the way, why did you kiss me? And Rick replies, I was about to be hanged. Seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and then Evelyn storms off and Rick, what? What'd I say? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's one of my favorite lines from the film, too. Uh, another favorite is when Jonathan is going to get the car and sees Imhotep's followers coming towards him, so he just acts like one of them to blend in. <laughs> I was watching Cinema Sins, and the creator of the video actually took off a couple of sins for this scene. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess it's another another rating. Uh, must be a, a video or something where they rate in films, and he knocked off the, a, a few negative points just for that alone. Nice says, I have to disagree with Tom that the sequels were abominations. Well, at least for the second film. I enjoyed it, despite the horrible CGI of the Scorpion King. The only good thing I can say about the third film is Jonathan's line, Die, you mummy bastards, die! <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm still going to stick to it. Anytime you have to bring a, a child into, the, into your film to continue the saga, you're on the wrong track. On a very special episode of The Mummy. <laughs> Cousin Oliver? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I appreciate your thoughts, but I, I dismiss them outright. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, listening, Floyd, and thanks for leaving that comment. That, that, that was fantastic. Yeah, that's fun. So, yeah, let's get into this week's episode, and we're going to talk about the 1933 film, The Invisible Man, directed by James Whale and starring Claude Rains as Dr. Jack Griffin, Gloria Stewart as Flora Cranley, William Harrigan as Dr. Arthur Kemp, and Henry Travers as Dr. Cranley. This is our first universal horror without Edward Van Sloan, but we do get an appearance by Dwight Fry as a reporter. <laughs> uh, Universal was actually thinking of using the Invisible Man as their follow-up to Dracula. Oh, really? Yes, uh, but I think there was, you know, they, they'd ask for some treatments and get some scripts, and I think there was just a lot of um, 
it just wasn't going right. They just weren't getting what they wanted, and it just kind of got put on the back burner, and uh, Frankenstein ended up going in between. Okay. And then, of course, The Mummy, obviously, and then finally, The, the Invisible Man. In this film, Dr. Jack Griffin has discovered the secret to invisibility. However, his discovery didn't come with a way to undo the process. He runs away from his work and his fiance to continue his research alone in order to find a way back to the visible world. Bandaged and covered head to toe, he stays at a small inn in the English countryside, where he attracts the attention of the local authorities after the landlords begin to complain about his rude behavior and chemical experiments. He reveals his in invisibility to the police and townspeople and rampages through the town, causing mischief. Griffin makes his way to the home of colleague Dr. Arthur Kemp. He threatens Kemp and forces him to help him retrieve his notes from the inn, which he had to leave behind. While doing so, Griffin kills the police chief. Griffin plans on Kemp being his visible partner while he creates havoc all over the globe. His end goal to prove how powerful invisibility can be to eventually sell his formula to the highest bidder. Kemp, fearing for his life, calls the police and Griffin's former employer, Cranley. Cranley and his daughter, Griffin's fiance Flora, try to reason with him, but when the police arrive, Griffin realizes Kemp has betrayed him and runs off, promising to kill Kemp at 10 o'clock the next night. He goes on a killing spree, terrorizing the surrounding area. The police, Cranley, Kemp, and Flora have to come up with a way to stop him. But how do you stop something you can't even see? So yeah, as a first-time watch, I'm almost sorry that this film has become so well known at least in the uh the the best bits yeah because i would have loved to have seen your take on this film with zero knowledge <laughs> but even though you kind of have probably seen the big scenes what was your uh your 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 thought on the film as a whole i'm gonna tell you we have watched dracula frankenstein and mummy and this one's my favorite. This one floored me. This is a well put together film, especially for the era. Uh, I, I and and I love that we come in hot. He's already invisible. He he he's busy searching for his cure while the madness sets in. And, and I love that. I love that they just engage you right away. Of course, the innkeeper's wife was killing me. <laughs> Good old Una O'Connor. Yeah. yeah. The, the incessant screaming for no apparent reason was 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 just adorable. But no, <laughs> I mean uh, the uh, Claude Rain's presence as the character, even all all done up in the bandages and all that, he's an intimidating look right out of the gate. And, and you're not even dealing with the invisibility part. And then when they actually start working in the invisibility stuff. That's some impressive damn effects for that <laughs> that year. <laughs> Very impressive. They dressed Claude Rains in a a, a a black velvet body stocking. Yeah. And filmed him against a black velvet background. Okay. So he'd be wearing his clothes and he'd be all black. So the camera obviously wouldn't see the black bits. And then of course they would film the the scene without him in it and then they just would you know superimpose the two shots on top of each other yeah. and they invented green screen before there was green screen yes i mean now we can do it digitally now we can do it in real time but this is just a i don't believe this is like the first time anything like this had been done no i'm but sure it is. is certainly probably one of the most extensive uses and i'm sure one of the best Oh, yeah, no, uh, and, and just the sheer volume where they're able to do it. I mean, seeing through the bandages when he'd start taking off the glasses and the nose piece. Oh, and that's actually even better. That is actually done with a uh, a wire frame, with the bandages around like a wire frame. Oh, okay, so they, they actually did a molding. Yes, they did, actually. That's cool. I, I, I hadn't realized. But no, because at, at first I'm even thinking, oh, wait, this is going to be super cheesy because he's invisible, but I see tufts of hair. 
and it didn't even occur to me till he started unwrapping for the first time. He wore a wig. I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, like, I, I was geeking out all over the place watching this thing. And then we'll get into some stuff that made me laugh out loud for continuity issues. Uh, but, <laughs> but while I'm watching it, I mean, it's just thoroughly engaging. The story's very well thought out. I mean, they even... Even uh, as they build through, you know he's invisible. You know he's stuck. He's trying to get out of it. But they they let it come later where you find out, oh, they uh, there he missed a piece of research that would have told him that what he used that actually activated the invisibility also would have psycho, psychotropic effects on, on, on his brain. And, and because it was in a... a in a piece of German research that he might not have come across, that's why he doesn't know that that's what's happening to him. And like, that's pretty cool. You really thought this through. No, it is absolutely one of the better, well thought out stories that we've seen. I do wish we could see him or see his descent into madness a little more. Sure. I mean, I do like the fact that we come in, as you said, hot. We come in in the middle of the story. Yeah. Effectively. But yeah, I just feel like there's the, oh, yeah, I'm invisible. I'm trying to find my way back. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill a bunch of people. You're like, wait, <laughs> what? I mean, it, it's a little bit of a whiplash moment. It is, yeah. But but because of that, I, I like that you're, you've are you got that huh factor. What's happening? I. Uh, I like it when they don't have to telegraph everything in advance. They give you something to make you ponder what's going on, and then they give you the little nuggets later that goes, ah, and that's why he also doesn't know what's happening to himself. He's devolving, and he doesn't know why. He's becoming homicidal. He has no idea why. And at some point, it's just fun for him. Right. Yeah, and he doesn't even question. Right. Yeah, it, it's completely warped his brain chemistry to the point that it's just, well, this is a perfectly reasonable uh, avenue for me to take. Right. You know, why, why would I even question whether this is right or wrong? And, and that's why it, it's, uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly for that. And the fact that we're on, along for the ride. We don't know what's happening to him the same time he doesn't know what's happening to him. And then by the time you're given the nuggets to figure out, Oh, okay. That that that's why he's like this, and he doesn't even realize it. Then he's just so over the top. He's gone. He he, he can't mm -hmm. he can't come back from where he's at anymore. One of the things that bothered me, and it particularly stood out for this watch, a Una O'Connor. Yeah, but uh, she was the most egregious of what I consider several moments where I feel like. It leaned a little heavy into some comedic bits. And I don't know yep. if it was meant to. I, I think it's just kind of over-the-top acting. Maybe that's it. I mean, all the police, with the exception of maybe the actual chief or whatever, are all portrayed as bumbling Keystone cops. There, there is a bit of that. Actually, uh, <laughs> I had to laugh, too. I had this thought as soon as the line came out. I'm like... Is this the first time somebody said this on screen when, when the co the first cop that we meet, he goes, what's all this then? Yeah. <laughs> like, really? Really? You said that out loud? <laughs> that was awesome. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wonder if that, that, that may very well have been. But yes, then that's and maybe it's just because that's become sort of like a trope among like Monty Python and, uh -huh. and other, you know, British comedy and everything that I can't hear it even in a serious manner or right. a serious context without kind of thinking it's a joke. Right. It just, it, it, I, there was a couple of moments. Uh, I actually had to look one up because as we get toward the end of the film and, and, and Griffin uh, keeps his promise to kill Kemp at 10 PM mm -hmm. and he does so by trapping him in his car and sending it over the cliff and the car explodes. Yeah. And, and I'm like, is this the first time a car exploded going over a cliff on <laughs> in cinema? I had to look it up. Apparently there was a car explosion in 19, 
1914. Oh. So I'm like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, there's no reason for that car to have exploded. <laughs> it did. I'm like, yes, that's awesome. A troop right out of the gate. I don't know. I'm guessing cars from the 1930s could very well be more prone to explosion than cars from the 1970s or, or 80s when they when it happened all the time on chips. <laughs> That's fair, but uh, it was weird. I, I was watching the car as it goes over, and it didn't even start where it hit. <laughs> like, yeah, it it, it hit on the front, that... but the back end blew up first. I'm like, okay. Yeah, it's one of those. Uh, one of those cases where you often see like action in films where the car goes creening off the cliff and it'll it's like in midair and then explodes. Like, did yeah. it hit a big bird? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, it, this felt like it had lots of good firsts. Like, like even if they weren't the first first, this is when you put it all together and made it all work. Carl LeMay, uh, you know, the head of Universal, had a really envi- originally envisioned. Boris Karloff as Griffin. Only because Boris Karloff is everybody's great bad guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was actually James Whale that really wanted somebody that sounded a little bit more intellectual. Mm-hmm. And uh, and had apparently heard or saw Claude Rains in a performance or while he was auditioning for something else and went, yeah, that guy will do. I like him. And I think even, uh, oh, who was it? There was someone else. Oh, I'm blanking on his name now. There was another actor, I think, that was approached, but he didn't want to do it because he wouldn't be on screen. Yeah, he wouldn't be seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, Claude Rains being an up-and-coming actor, yeah, you want to pay me? Uh, <laughs> bandages on my face? That's fine. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. But, no, uh, for for having to be all trussed up like that all the time, his personality and... and, and and his effective uh, emoting of everything. And you could hear the crazy without it seeming like it's fully crazy. Uh, he, he had a nice touch to it. He has a, an amazing gift with his voice mm-hmm. and how he can use it. Because there's the moments when he's very gentle with mm-hmm. how he's speaking. When he's speaking with Flora, and, oh, darling, and just the way he talks, it's it, you know, it puts you at ease. Mm-hmm. And then there's the when he goes, you're driving me insane and you won't leave me alone. And you get out and thinking, OK, I'm gone. Yeah. You know, when, this, when, the, this... when the bass gets into his voice and he really sinks in and starts chewing on those words. And like, yeah. Or or when he's like he's talking to Kemp and he he's threatening him without ever raising his voice. Mm-hmm. Well, you wouldn't do that, would you? Because you know what would happen. And you're like, oh, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, and, and they they made really good use of the fact, like, everyone was deeply terrified when he was just straight up invisible. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I gave him a lot of credit, too, to some of the stuff uh, that Griffin was talking about, about being invisible. They thought through the whole, um, when he eats, the, the food doesn't disappear until it's fully digested, so you would see it. Uh, and he's talking about the other things. The only one he didn't touch on, which I'm going to give a slight nod, even though we didn't watch the Kevin Bacon Invisible Man, it was brought up in that one. The concept of if you're invisible, you can see through your own eyelids. <laughs> so he didn't discuss that sleeping might be a challenge like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they didn't go that far. Yeah, uh, Hollow Man was the Kevin Bacon uh, yeah. film. Yeah, and I will that'll that'll come up later in this episode. Yep. <laughs> no, they didn't address all of that. There was one thing; it was weird in the dialogue. Uh-huh. He mentions, you know, make sure there's a you know a, a, you know a wrap in the car. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's a little cold when you're having to run around naked all the time. So I mean, it's it's in the dialogue that he is running around stark naked yeah. when he's fully invisible. But at the end of the film, we see his footprints. Yeah. And they are obviously not bare feet. And it's like, I was it just, was it too hard to do bare feet in the effect? Or was there like concern that that was a little too visual that he was be unclothed? 
Yeah, you feel like you got to dial into what were the conversations uh, and what did they think they could get on screen? Because I could see that being a thing is um, if you saw feet and toe imprints in the snow, further emphasizing that he's naked, that that would cause the audience, to, their imagination to run wild about what's what he actually looks like completely nude standing there, despite the fact you can't see him. <laughs> right. So, but yes, no, I, I, I noticed that too. That kind of drove me crazy. I'm like, those are clearly boot marks. <laughs> yes. But yeah, the, just the fact that it was in the dialogue. Right. But then not visually, they, you know, inferenced in the film. Like you could have like, made a foot mold to make, uh, make those imprints in the snow or for God's sakes, just have somebody walk in the snow and then edit them out. <laughs> I read somewhere that they actually did a thing with um, they had the snow like stuff on a platform with uh, the, the, the feet cutouts with like pegs and they would pull out the peg one at a time. Oh, so it would make drop it sink make... out from underneath. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. OK. That's an interesting way to do it. Rather than doing it with like a, a stop motion. Yeah. In which case, then the the shape of a, a shoe is probably a little easier because it's all uniform. Right. Um, but I, yeah, I get that. It would it, be interesting to go back and kind of hear the conversations about how they decided to do some of those things. Yeah, again, that's that's why I would want a time machine. <laughs> and, and, and speaking of, this is where I'm going to interject the one that did have me laugh out loud for, for the mis- I. I don't know if it's so much of a mistake, but it, like somebody has to tell me what happened. So we we get one. Griffin has one of his uh, rages and and kills the police chief in the bar while everybody after everybody has evacuated the lion's den, um, and he does it just because he can, more or less. And, and then we cut to a scene where. Uh, the newsies have the newspaper informing the public it's in print that the invisible man has killed the police chief, uh, whatever. And then we cut to the next scene of them still hauling the body out of the lion's den. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, that is the fastest damn newspaper on the planet. <laughs> I didn't notice that. You didn't notice that? That one I... stuck out huge. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> they were waiting by the presses for something like this to happen. <laughs> Small town, big news day. I, think, I you know. Yeah. <laughs> either way, that, that had me rolling. Uh, I'm like, no, you didn't just do that, really? <laughs> I actually found that them going back to the inn, I felt like, it's like, uh do we have to? Right. Because I I didn't find any of these characters enjoyable to be around. <laughs> Una O'Connor especially, and and the police chief. Well, oh, well, you well you're drunk and you just hit your head and all this stuff and like why are we here? <laughs> yeah, uh, I was. A, I'll admit to being a little confused on locations because it was clear at the beginning of the film he is going to this town and the lion's den to get away from those that know him so that he can work in secret on his cure. But how far away was that from where he was? Cause they seemed to interact with that. Like they were next door to each other. It must've been only miles. I, I, I guess. I mean, we saw him walking, so yeah, yeah um, he had to have walked there. And, but yeah, he he and Kemp can drive there easily in a single night. Yes, and then back to Kemp's. And, so and, I and, think it's only a matter of miles. And, but and it's enough that the po- apparently the police in both locations are able to deal with this as if it's a single thing. They're like that's some major collaboration going on in a town that barely has a phone. Yeah, I've just I found myself actually once we get done, he he has his outrage, he unwraps himself, he escapes from the from the inn, and you're like, okay, great, let's keep moving. Yep. Nope, nope, we're gonna go back and we're gonna have a, a little trial. Like, you you really, this I feel like maybe was the uh, 1933 version of padding. 
Yeah. I mean, it, they had one reason to go back the first time. He needed to get his gear. He had to escape, so he needed to get his books. I get yep, Grant that. That's fine. Right. I don't have a problem with that. I don't need to see the uh, sort of mock trial or, or inquest, you know, that the, the local police constable is having with everybody to try to explain what's going on with these weird occurrences. It's like, why, why are we sitting through this? Right. Right. No, absolutely. I, that that part was strange. Like I said, I, I'm I'm giving some grace to the fact that this is still very early filmmaking, early storytelling through this medium. All of everything that they do is probably straight up crazy expensive compared to the day. So I I, I get I'm giving them a lot of room on, on some of that because they otherwise they told a very effective. And, and, and very thrilling story, and, and it was yeah. well put together. I'm so thrilled you enjoyed it. I I do think it, it's it is one of the best. It really is. It's not one of the Universal films that gets a lot of love. There's love amongst people that of true fans, mm-hmm. but it's not it's not Dracula. It's not Frankenstein. No, and, but but. In the same vein of why I really like Frankenstein being essentially the birth of science fiction, this continues that. This is straight up science fiction. Um, so there's reason for like science is involved in, in his creation. He is the scientist trying to even cure himself, and he doesn't fully understand what's happened to him. I love all that. It's not just mystical. It's not otherworldly. He did this to himself, and, <laughs> and and he is suffering the consequences of his actions of trying to play God. <laughs> and that actually even highlights my point, though. When we talked about Frankenstein... Mm-hmm. I mentioned that, oh, yeah, yeah, this is pretty unique in the universal horrors, is that it's science and not supernatural, completely forgetting about the Invisible Man. That is exactly the same thing. Yeah, and I knew that of it, but I haven't spent enough time with Invisible Man to go, oh, yeah, this is the stuff that I like. (laughs) (laughs) So, no, it was amazing. I loved it. I just will end this with just a a fun story story uh the recent 2024 monster bash that i attended earlier this summer uh jessica rains claude rains's daughter okay. was there oh cool and and she did a q a and kind of talked about her father and uh you know the, the the his his films and that sort of thing and i don't believe she, i think she was born several years after the invisible man came out so she didn't see it until much later mm-hmm. she was either very young or hadn't been born yet but as a young girl uh they were living in in a, in a town i want to say upstate new york i think they actually had a uh, a farm the uh, local theater was doing like a revival and it was playing the invisible man and so Claude Rains took her to go see the film. Okay. And of course, and he goes and he's, he's all bundled up. He's got a hat and he's got the coat with the, you know, trying to be incognito, mm-hmm. f- completely forgetting that he's Claude Rains, you know, and he's got the voice of Claude Rains. And so and he, now they, he's dressing like the character. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and the two of them go up to the ticket booth. And of course there's, Claude Rain saying, you know, two tickets, please. And the guy's like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jessica Rain said what was so much fun is they sat in the back of the theater and they started watching the film. And as they're watching it, he just starts telling her, oh, this is how we did this. And this is how they did that. <laughs> and she's, and I, I read elsewhere. She didn't go into it. She didn't mention this, but I read it in another uh, excerpt of, of her telling the story that, a lot of people around them stopped watching the film and just started listening to him <laughs> talk about the film. <laughs> well, that that's amazing. But as, as him, I would have been so moved to try to, cause his laugh, his, his laugh <laughs> as Griffin it, it, it is just haunting and, and, and very, it's got a presence to it. And, and, and 
I would have loved for him to do something like he's sitting at the back, the film finishes, and he just busts out in his own creepy laugh <laughs> and, and have everybody turn and go, ah! <laughs> that would have been fun. Tales of her dad were really interesting. They, Like I said, they, they owned a farm, and she said that he seemed to be his most happiest when he was out tending his garden. You know, on this farm, everything that I that I hear about him and from her stories, he was just a very humble and down to earth individual. Yeah, he, he would have been amazing to meet. I'm sure that would have been very cool. Just fun stories, just a, a nice way to just when, he, when you see the characters that he plays, especially in this. Yeah, and to know that he's very much not Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm sure that he's not, but that, then that means he's all the more effective as an actor. Oh, absolutely. No, he, he he was a brilliant actor. I love him in absolutely everything I've seen him in, whether it's Invisible Man, Casablanca, uh, some small B picture that he did to fill time, yeah. you know, whatever. He brings his A game. He, he raises the bar yeah. for the film, and he's, he was always just amazing to watch. No, that's amazing. So did you were able to dig up any reviews from 1933 or any of the uh, re-releases as unfortunately we've had to uh, settle with in some of the other films? Sure. Uh, uh, and, and this is Wikipedia to the rescue. <laughs> so uh, they had some interesting cuts from there. Uh, it was a very well-received movie for the time. Uh, so much so that we have the New York Times, uh, Mordant... Hall commented on the originality of the material, calling it a remarkable achievement. And from uh, the New York Times, this movie actually placed number nine in its top ten list for 1933. So, out of all the films of 1933, they really liked this one. Uh, And then when uh, someone from Variety that went by Char as the name... Uh, stated it brought something new and refreshing to a film frighteners. So really leaning into that whole, this was kind of cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then finally, I got a, a, a little snippet from uh, the New York Post, uh, Thornton uh, Delahanty. I hope I'm saying that right. One of the best thrillers of the year. So uh, I got lots of little movie quote kind of things. You could totally picture uh, Don LaFontaine reading these off. <laughs> <laughs> but put him back in 1933. <laughs> so I had to think of the time and of the films and the films that we had seen so far, even just from Universal, mm. that everyone going into this would be expecting another Dracula, sure. another Frankenstein, another mummy. A by the numbers film. Yeah. And this would have, I think, just absolutely blown them away. It, it would, but it did still managed to get the abrupt end. <laughs> it did, yes. Yeah. Just a, a very quick a single line. <laughs> yes. I tampered in God's domain effectively, and that's the end of the film. Yeah, yeah, it just he's dead. What was the killing me about that scene though? Is he dies, but while he was dying originally, um, What's what was his uh his love's lo- name? Flora. 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 Because I'm thinking Una. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> it was Gregory. not Una. <laughs> but no, Flora. Flora is there by her side. But when he becomes visible after dying, she's not sitting in the chair. <laughs> the camera pulls back enough that you can see the chair. She ain't there. Like, <sighs> oh my god, she's invisible. <laughs> <laughs> like. Not only are we going out on an abrupt ending, but you did it with a continuity glitch. Yeah. <laughs> like, so that was fun. That's hilarious. Yep. All right. Well, with that, let's take a little short break here and uh, we'll play a promo for another show. And then when we get back, we are sticking with the Invisible Man, this time from 2020. Enjoy movies like Carnival of Souls, The Mole People, Black Sunday, and The Tingler. 
Do you find yourself late at night reading magazines such as Film Max, Chiller Theater, or Monster Bash? Do you love vintage television programs like Sky King, Outer Limits, and The Time Tunnel? Do you find yourself surfing the net looking for the next monster movie festival or expo? Do you enjoy hearing anecdotes, cinematic details, and unusual insights into some of your favorite movies? If you answered yes to any of the above, you are encouraged to join your host, Vince Rotolo, as he examines some of the latest horror, sci-fi, and cult theatrical releases, new DVDs to add to your collection, and of course, the old classics, both good and bad. He even interviews people throughout B Moviedom. So tune into B Movie Cast at bmoviecast.com. All right, The Invisible Man from 2020 was directed by Lee Wanell. It stars Elizabeth Moss as Cecilia, Aldous Hodge as James, Storm Reed as Sydney, Oliver Jackson Cohen as Adrian Griffin, Harriet Dreyer as Emily, and Michael Dorman as Tom Griffin. To escape from her abusive boyfriend, wealthy optics engineer and corporate CEO Adrian Griffin, Cecilia drugs him and sneaks out in the middle of the night, barely getting away with help of her sister Emily. Cecilia stays with a friend, James, a San Francisco police detective, and his teenage daughter, Sydney. Suffering from post-traumatic stress from her experience with Adrian and fearful that he will find her, Cecilia stays in the home and barely even steps outside. Two weeks after her escape, Emily visits and tells Cecilia that Adrian has committed suicide. Shortly thereafter, she learns at a meeting with Adrian's brother and lawyer, Tom, that a trust was set up by Adrian to provide Cecilia with $5 million. Despite her life seemingly returning to normal, Cecilia can't help but feel there is another presence in the house, but James assures her she is still just stressed, traumatized, and paranoid. Soon it becomes clear to her that she isn't just imagining things, and she confronts Tom, declaring that she believes Adrian faked his death and is somehow invisibly tormenting her, an idea that is quickly rebuffed. Things escalate and becomes increasingly obvious that something, or someone, is trying to drive a wedge between her and everything she loves. Right, yes, you said you have seen this one before. This was a first-time watch for me. What, did you see this in the theater, or did you see it shortly after it came to, like, uh, home video or streaming? Yeah, no, I, I remember watching this through, like, an HBO or something like that. First blush, my thought was, you know, this has a lot more to do with Hollow Man than it does with the Invisible Man. Yes, despite the use of the ter- uh, of the last name Griffin. That seems to be the only connection. It is very odd. I mean, the uh, idea of an invisible man is not proprietary to H.G. Wells. Right. Uh, so I'm not sure why they they could have called it anything. I guess just for the... Uh, well, for one, this is a universal film. Mm. I believe it was originally planned to be part of their quote-unquote dark universe mm. That they were trying to do, uh, which fell apart quickly after the failure of their mummy film. Yeah. So I suppose it was just them trying to sort of uh, ride on the coattails yeah. of, of one of their previous hits, of their classic films. Yeah. There's actually uh, conflicting reports. The uh, director claims that, no, no, this was never meant to be tied in with any universe, and there's other people that say yeah yeah we were planning to but we decided against it so (laughs) who knows right but this was an interesting take on the idea and it's even one that they didn't take with hollow man with hollow man i still think we kind of followed the exploits of the invisible man whereas this one we truly follow his victim right and the idea of using invisibility as a uh a method of terrorizing somebody. Yeah, no, this was an interesting direction to go in. And you, you do, you have to look at it as uh, the only thing that it has in common with the invisible man is there's an invisible man. How yeah. he's invisible is completely different. The, uh, everything before is a, is a chemical reaction that causes the body to actually be invisible. This one's an optical illusion made by a suit. Which in and of itself is an interesting take on, on 
on doing this and probably the more logical way any of that might actually ever be a thing. Um, Lord knows military is always working on camouflage kind of potential. That's all this was. Mm -hmm. uh, but taken to a very dark place in, in, in doing it. Um, reading, uh, when we get into things like uh, reviews and all, doing uh, something, uh, reading some of the stuff that uh, was related to reviews, uh, it, it's important to ta understand this is all at the height of like the Me Too movement too. So it is latching on to that whole thing and it wants to make, it wants it, you to have a very visceral experience about what it's like to be a woman terrorized. And now you're going to add a science fiction component where the terrorizer, every, but normally in a victimization scenario, there are always going to be those people that are naysayers that think, oh, you're just being overly dramatic. You're being crazy. That's not really what's happening. In this case, everybody really does think she's crazy because the guy actually is invisible and he set up a very good con as to why everybody thinks she's crazy. So, in fact, you touched on in the synopsis the Tom Griffin character doing the naysaying uh, about it. But that scene where he actually gives her reasons for her own insanity based on his own experience with his brother, he sells it so well that despite we know what's going on, we have seen what's going on, he gives you enough to go, mm, that sounds plausible. <laughs> like you gave him a reason to know the guy's dead. <laughs> I actually kind of appreciated that of this film that for the first, probably the first half of this film, there's really no physical evidence for the viewer mm -mm. that there is somebody stalking her. Right. It could easily all be in her head. This is actually a movie that could have probably even gotten it, could have been, I don't know, ratcheted up its creepiness factor if they didn't call it The Invisible Man. Like, if you had given this a title and then maybe buried the lead a little bit more, and keep the character called Griffin so that those that know where that comes from gets a little sense, what does that mean? Um, but if you had buried the whole point that there is an actual invisible man and let the, let the audience have to figure it out with her... Uh, you to heighten the creepiness of this a whole lot more. I agree. I agree. Well, I, you know, I hadn't thought about that until just now. And now I'm like, this would have been an incredible film if that had been like in the middle of the movie. You go, oh, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because actually uh, one of the things that's deeply effective of this is because it is a suit and the suit is creepy as hell. <laughs> <laughs> so when it malfunctions, it's even creepier. <laughs> so there was a scene, I, I remember I had seen this film and I still kind of jumped out of my skin the first time the suit is damaged and somebody turns and there's a partial black form out of nowhere. They're like, holy crap, what the... <laughs> like, <laughs> it got me again. And I'm like, if you had totally taken out and made it seem like this could be even just a ghost... Like, give, give her a reason that she's being haunted and then turn it, go all Scooby-Doo and find out it, it's a guy in a suit. Um, but that would have been fun. <laughs> so, yeah, calling it the Invisible Man gives away too much of what you're going to see. The film includes a, a lot of those jump scares that I love mm -hmm. that there's nothing to be scared of. But you're still on edge. I mean, it's the it's the pan into an empty room, and you're like, "Oh my God, what's happening?" And oh my, oh, it's just her walking across to get something from the table, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and that's, I'm I'm not gonna lean too much into this whole the title undoes it a bit, but think about the earlier scenes before we actually know what's going on, and, but she's always got this sense that somebody's there. Never is it more creepy than staring into an empty room when you know your character thinks something's there and you can't see it. 
mm-hmm. and, and you don't know why you can't see it. So you keep kind of concentrating even more on the scenery to go, something's going to happen. What's going to move? Is something jumping out at me at any moment? And, and it's actually very effective when nothing happens at all. <laughs> it reminds me of um, when we did our basement remodel. Mm-hmm. Originally, it was standard drywall, crappy drop ceiling, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. And we had the insulated cloth uh, panels put up. Mm-hmm. And the first time I came downstairs, after the, all the panels were up, the echo was gone that you were used to hearing. Yeah, the deadened sound. <laughs> yeah, it was deadened sound. And it was almost painful because you would speak and you were waiting for the sound to come back and it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And it was it was very uncomfortable for those first few days. And I feel like that's a little bit like what you're talking about here. But visually, when the camera is just panned into a corner of a room, you know, it's 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 muted lighting. Mm-hmm. There is that little bit of a a, a, a drone of a, of a soundtrack, you know, underneath. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of trying to ramp everything up and you're struggling. You're looking. Yeah. What's there? Yeah. What am I trying to see? And there isn't anything, but your mind is saying, I should be seeing something. Whenever she'd look at a piece of furniture where the seat cushion was just a little off, wasn't clear that there was like a butt sitting in it, but it was dented in just a way where, is there something there or isn't there something there? And, and it was that kind of stuff was very effective. They were very good at this. And then yeah. I'm just going to jump in with the whole, the effects were off the hook in this. I, uh, um, for doing an invisibility thing, um, like the fight sequences when she'd be fighting with him in his full on invisible mode, I, it was very effective. You were pretty sure that there was somebody there that you could not see trashing the hell out of her. And, and I'm like, damn, this is really, <laughs> really impressive stuff. No, absolutely. Right down to even just other little things. The way it wasn't, it wasn't things on a, a, a on a fishing line moving around the <laughs> room or anything like that. And that's what was impressive about even the Claude Rains film is even though they did some of that, they did it pretty well that it was super smooth. This took it to a whole other level. Well, this they took effectively the idea that was kind of laid down in the thirty three film, uh-huh. and then. Of course, with the now the modern magic of, of, of digital filmmaking and, and modern effects, you can have somebody in that, in in this case, a green or uh, you know a green body stocking mm-hmm. or a motion capture suit or whatever, be there and interact with your actors, and then just completely erase them, right? But- and it looks completely flawless because it it doesn't look like someone's faking it because they're not. Right. Because they're holding on to someone's arm. They're being, you know, there's a stunt person being thrown by someone, by another stunt person. Oh, and, but what makes it extra impressive is you know that's part of how they're doing it. But that means they have to digitally superimpose the parts that you're going to see that the green person would be blocking. And they do it right. so effectively that it, you all, you can't really tell. So that ratchets the creepy factor up extra. You don't even think about it so much. Like, uh, the power of invisibility seems like such a throwaway power that that it, it's commonplace in, in, like, superhero stuff and all that, too. And, and you don't really recognize how effective it is till you put it in the right spot. And in a... In a granted, uh, there are some that argue whether this was horror or thriller more... Um, fits a little in both categories. I would call it a horrific thriller. <laughs> there maybe. you go. <laughs> uh, but regardless of your stance, it works really well in this because now you get the full effect of how intimidating it can be to be terrorized by something that's not there. <laughs> mm-hmm. I do feel like I have to bring up that... <sighs> I have, I don't want to say problems or issues. There's just, there's things about the story that just niggle at me Mm -hmm. a little bit. What film don't they? (laughs) Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. 
but it, it's things that are that are major points to the that to this plot. Yeah. That you just kind of once the solution or once the things are kind of revealed at the end of the film, you go back to the some of the beginning and go, what was the point of you know the supposed suicide of Adrian Griffin? Mm-hmm. Either he faked it or his brother faked it, but why? Yeah. I, I'm I'm not sure what the point of that was, and then then taking that to the step of terrorizing Cecilia. Unless if it was all Tom, you know, was it a monetary gain that if he can drive Cecilia crazy, then he gets control of the trust? You know, but that's never that's never really explained or brought up. So you you bring up uh, some interesting points, and I had some of this the first time I watched it. Is because they do leave some stuff out there where, depending on where your head is at, you interpret it different. Like you're pointing out, is it Adrian? Is it Tom? What's the motivation? Because from my perspective. I saw it as always Tom and Adrian have been in on this from the beginning. Adrian is the control freak in all this. He's found ways to to make his brother part of this to the point where his brother is a co-conspirator in all things insidious about this. So he's all in. He's probably being controlled, which is why he's the he's the dupe at the end. But yeah, but you don't get enough to go, do I, uh, should I know that? Should you have given me some story on that? Is that important? I don't know because the same thing happens on the tail end when, when she gets her revenge, so to speak. They want you to think, did she get her revenge? Uh, I mean, you know something happened. You know there was an invisible person and you know she has access to a suit. But she's also couched it enough that maybe she didn't do it or, or not. And I know on my first watch, I kind of questioned this time around. I'm like, nah, she did that and she just got James to lie for her uh, because he, he's buying what she's selling. That's the way I took it for sure. Yeah. But that's actually one of the things I loved about the film is it leaves you questioning whether or not Adrian was responsible Mm -hmm. because he says no no i didn't do any of this i i i I didn't kill your sister i wasn't the one stalking you it was always tom but they also have him sitting there with a pretty evil sneer on his face when he thinks he's in the room alone yeah so yeah did she get revenge or did she just commit cold-blooded murder and that's the thing, and this is where it's a little insidious in all of that, is that you already know that Adrian is not a good guy. Right. We absolutely know that he is an abusive boyfriend. Right. That is without question. I am not questioning that at all, because we saw how he reacted at the beginning of the film. I believe Cecilia and what she says about him. Okay, that's that's off the table. I, I understand that. And, and this is where, and it, it, this is where you have a sit down with the writers and the director uh, to talk about this. It, it is okay. You want to point out that Adrian is bad, no question, right out of the gate. You've introduced the Tom brother character way later with no context to it. We, you, you find out that he's the brother only through the the, the offer of the money. Uh, Because that's the first time you even meet him. It's clear he's not a huge fan of his brother either, but both in... He he eludes a little at the first thing. The second time we see him, when he's convincing her that he's dead and he was abusive and he controlled us both, uh, when he's doing that, you, you can buy that. He's very good at that. So the question is... And I think the movie still wants you to answer this question uh, for yourself is, do we have two co-conspirators in the same plan or are they both bad for different reasons? And she she, she wants to either hear 
that Adrian is guilty of doing everything, even before Tom was involved. Or she's looking for an excuse to kill him because she hates that he controls her every thought. And de despite the fact that Tom is now out of the picture, she's going to kill him no matter what. Because that's the only way she's going to feel safe going forward. I think the only way the story works mm -hmm. with the faked suicide is if they are co-conspirators right. through the entire thing. Right. That for whatever reason, Adrian decided that if I can't have you, no one can sort of thing and would go to these extremes to, to drive her mad and to ruin her life and to destroy her life. It, it, this doesn't work any other way. Right, and, and I get I get that. This is the, the hard part in that. It, this is either very clever or just too confusing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you feel almost compelled to go with, it's clever so that you don't come off as the person that's confused. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. I don't know. I, I don't know. Come on. Lee, come on. Uh, let's uh, let's have a sit down. We'll talk this out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is definitely one. I, I feel like I need to go back to the library and get the disc and see if there's a commentary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I did not watch the commentary, and I, I feel I, I really want to on this one. Yeah, I I, I could probably go for a bit of commentary on this because I'd uh, I'd let, it, it's obviously a psychological thriller horror movie. There's a lot to it and, and it, it's very much putting the the frustration and the panic and the fear that comes from being in an abusive relationship and it's putting it right in your face and, and you're having to deal with it while you're watching this so and this is an expression of that but I want to know a little bit more where you are going with some of this there's also the moment where Cecilia is in the psychiatric hospital she fakes an attempted suicide in order to reveal Adrian slash Tom, yeah. the invisible stalker. Yeah. She manages to damage the suit, so now he is occasionally appearing and disappearing. There are now witnesses that there is someone with the ability to turn invisible. Yep. There's witnesses, security footage. Okay. Her story is now corroborated. She could just go hide in a broom closet. Mm -hmm. She's clear. Yeah. But she doesn't. Right. She goes on the revenge kick. Yep. So, is Cecilia a good person? <laughs> this, this is that conversation. This is that psychological part. Can you, the viewer, put yourself in a situation where you know that you have been tormented to the point? Like, we didn't get enough at the beginning, um... And that's, I think, a part of the tease in this. When we when we meet any of the characters, we're watching Cecilia escape from her home. From her home. She lives there. She has all the access codes. She can do whatever she wants. But she is so terrified of the man that she is with that she has to plan her escape from the home that she lives in. So... You have to be able to kind of put yourself in that headspace. Can you make your, convince yourself that you are so terrified of the person that you're supposed to be closest to? And what would that do to you? Would, that, would, would, would the satisfaction of just proving you're right be enough? Or, do you, or will you ever feel safe again until that human being is no longer on this planet? And, and this is where I'm going to actually side with her on her choice. Because everyone, no, no matter the fact that they know there's now an invisible man, that there's enough evidence, he still has the suit. He could get away. Um, he could get away long enough to at least repair the damn thing and then disappear outright forever. So knowing that that could still be a thing that could happen... <laughs> Wouldn't you maybe be motivated to go the rest of the way? So uh, I actually kind of give credit for that. All right. Yeah, fair enough. Now, outside of that, there are just the small, really nitpicky bits mm -hmm. where if I weren't watching it critically, I, I probably wouldn't even think about it. Right. 
the dog has apparently just been wandering around the property for weeks. I, I <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure. Yeah, who's feeding it? Who's watering it? Who's taking it out? Yeah. And why exactly. isn't it just bat crap crazy by the time somebody shows up again? <laughs> I mean, she releases it. We don't know what happened to it after she let it go when she first escaped, and and between and there was two weeks before Adrian supposedly committed suicide. We don't know what happened to the dog. From the, to that point on, we have no idea, but it shows up and then promptly just disappears again. That's what they could have called this film, is the reappearing and the disappearing dog. I, the dog was a weird element and almost didn't need to, it, it, I, I would argue, didn't need to be in the film at all. It just adds no. a weird layer to it that didn't need to be there. Yeah, she could have, rather than accidentally hitting the dog bowl while in the kitchen... When she was going downstairs, she could have accidentally tripped on a broom that hit the car and set off the alarm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, no, you, didn't need uh, a dog. you could add a thousand ways to have accidentally triggered the car alarm. Yes. So, yeah, no, uh, I grant you that one a thousand percent. <laughs> and yes, and I, I, you know, the dog runs off barking at something and, you know, you're waiting for that, you know, off screen yelp. Right. To signify that the, the dog has been killed. And now the dog just goes barking and disappears and... That's okay. Bye, Zeus. That that's the end of the dog. They just never seen again. Guess maybe they just wanted her to walk off with the dog at the end. Huh. Yeah, that's oh, that's right. We do see him at the very end. We when see she's... him at the end. But uh, again, that raises more questions because I but mean, where the hell was he? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of time that has gone by in this film, and that dog is always there in a convenient moment. I don't know. Yeah. And then the other bit was, you know, she finds a second suit. Mm-hmm. she's able to deactivate it with a pad on a wall. Yeah. And then she hides it and stashes it. Yeah. Giving her an opportunity to find it later and allegedly use it to, right. <laughs> to murder Adrian. Yeah. How does she know how the suit works? It, it, exactly. Because, I mean, the pads suggest you have to interact with something exterior to the suit to activate the thing. Well, that's in a t- completely different area of the house. She'd have had no time to get to it. So, yes, unless in the interior of the suit, there's a big green button that says <laughs> on. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. There, invisible mode. <laughs> there's a bit of that. There, there's one. Uh, I don't know if you're going to bring it up, but because I watched the 33 and, and Griffin in the 33 mentions ways that he could be seen. And, mm-hmm. and he mentions, if I stand in the rain, you will see mm-hmm. the water. Well, we had a rain sequence. We never saw the rain on the suit. We sorted it. Only I, I in did. the middle of a fight, though, like when there was some interaction. If he's just standing still, you didn't see anything. Because mm. there was a lot of that. It, it, it was because. There was literally the scene where he's like right there behind her and she turns around and he phases back in because the suit's glitching. But up to that point, you didn't see the water coming off of a form. The closest we got was fa- was uh, the, the cold breath coming from his from his mouth when, in an earlier scene when it wasn't. Yes. Yeah, it, that, that, that was the only time they ever gave something like that. Which didn't really make all that much sense either no because he must have been holding his breath most of the damn time (laughs) well and the way that the 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 suit was apparently constructed wouldn't really lend itself for the breath to escape in the first place i and i actually uh the suit itself as cool as it kind of looked uh it was unclear how you did anything in it (laughs) no exactly um, so yes, in, in the rain, it would have been neat to see the silhouette being mm. with the rain, and or maybe just uh, the the puddle, you know, rings in a puddle where his feet were, or yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, and they uh, missed opportunity I, I, for all of the cool stuff that they did with their invisibility. I thought that was missed opportunity. I was expecting a lot more out of that part than I got. Very impressive film, though. Mm. I mean, it it did it did the really good job of making you feel uncomfortable walking into an empty room. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> I mean, I, I just get up to go get something to drink out of the kitchen, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not actually that comfortable leaving <laughs> your company. You know, I'm looking at my wife. Uh, I just... <laughs> Could you come with me? To... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it does. It feels a little bit like, uh, like you know, Jaws. You yeah. know, just when you thought it was safe to <laughs> go to the beach. Uh, I feel like this film kind of did a little bit of the same thing. Well, yeah, like the uh, the earlier when when he kind of shows that he's somewhere, and, and there's that bedroom sequence where he's yes. taking that down, and then he stands on the sheet, and then. Mm-hmm gets off of it and she, she's fairly certain she knows what she's encountering but doesn't know what to do about it at all and it just making it all the more freaky that it's happening and and this is where i go back to the whole maybe don't call it the invisible man that could have been a ghost mm-hmm. <laughs> up until it's not <laughs> yeah i don't know I, it would have been fun to just keep the audience guessing mm-hmm. and wondering what the heck is going on. The thing is, though, when it's finally revealed, you'd get a whole lot of people that would go, oh, that's cool. And you get a whole lot of people that go, what? Yeah. <laughs> Cop out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I'm going to give it a little room on this front, too, since the the thrust of this is to tell the the traumatization story probably didn't want to lean into the mystery of it as much it wanted you to feel the torment not the uh yeah not not the wonder what's happening part yeah no absolutely no very true what reviews did you find for the 2020 invisible man uh for the 2021 uh we've got uh a, an interesting array uh over a, for the most part an overly positive round of uh of reviews, uh, but to start, we've got from RogerEbert.com, uh, Tomris Laffley. She uh, writes that the abusive male himself might be unseen, but the fear he spreads is in plain sight in the Invisible Man, Lee Wanell's sophisticated sci-fi horror that dares to turn a woman's often silenced trauma from a toxic relationship into something unbearably tangible. Charged by a constant psychological dread that surpasses the ache of any visible bruise, Winnell's ingenious genre entry amplifies the, pl- the pain of its central character, Cecilia Cass, at every turn, making sure that her visceral scars sting like our own, sometimes to an excruciating degree. So, um, Nice. She leaned in heavy on the, on the trauma that was going on in this film. Um, then over at New York Magazine, uh, I apparently also called The Vulture, uh, Allison Wilmore. The Invisible Man is not as smart as it could have been, but the concept is ingenious even if the execution gets slapdash. And with Moss at the center, it doesn't matter all that much. She sells what's approached as B-movie material with an unwavering dedication of someone starring in a prestige biopic. So, somewhere in the middle of the road there on that. Yeah, yeah. I like it, but had its issues. Hmm. Yeah, and then at IndieWire, we have Jude Dry. Uh, The best... Genre films play on society's most pressing fears, but in his li- limp reworking of H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man, Lee Winnell tries melding everything from gaslighting to anxiety around data privacy into a crude technological thriller that is part sci-fi, part horror, and all around a mess. Why, why why Hollywood's favorite unhinged woman, Elizabeth Moss, chose to lend her considerable talents to a mystery bigger than how her stalker ex managed to make himself invisible. So, not not a fan. No, not a fan. It sounds like he wanted more of the nuts and bolts of... He, he wanted to see Griffin develop his suit. I, granted, again, using the, the, the title, The Invisible Man comes with some baggage. In this person person's case, they took the entire steamer trunk with them uh, because they want, they're, they're really leaning into that H.G. Wells component, and this is not that. No. <laughs> this is a different No, film. I think that's very much it. He was definitely looking for a remake Right. And he found a completely different film. Yes. That shared a name. Yes. Is that it with uh, those reviews? That that's what I had got for this. 
All right, well, that, I think, is going to end our discussion on The Invisible Man, both versions of... A really fun conversation. This was a this was a great twofer. <laughs> it really was. It was, and that's you get the shared name, but way different experiences. Oh, very much. You know, there was uh, four or five sequels to the thirty three film. Yeah, that had less and less to do with the thirty three film as they progressed, and there is talk. Oh. There has been talk about a sequel to the twenty twenty film. Even to this day. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I think a fairly recent interview or a Q&A or something with Elizabeth Moths said, if you guys want it, you're the ones who've got to say it. Right. You come up with, and you know, you say you want one and they come up with something interesting, we'll talk. Yeah, it, it causes me to germinate a few ideas myself right off the get back, so... I, I mean, the end of the film, she's walking off with the suit. Yep. We know that she has maybe a darker side to her, or certainly a side that has been traumatized. No, and she's let herself out. She's freed herself from this, but the manner in which she's freed herself lends to what's next. And, and, and then you add the extra wrinkle. James knows she has the suit. He saw it in the bag. So... Uh, yeah, no, there's there's some there's some stuff there. You very much could take this some places that I think would, in the end, leave you a little uncomfortable considering the theme, the the basic theme of this first film. If you suddenly turn your 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 victimized heroine of the film of this film and turn her into the villain, you often see and hear in real life uh-huh. how the abused become the abusers. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think you you could do something with this. It, yeah, it's just all a matter of do you fear you undo what you just did? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, which is probably why it's hemming and hawing at the moment. Yes. <laughs> and not to mention a studio has to be okay with the, that was pretty dark the first time around. What are you going to do now? <laughs> and, and how do we look in having you do it? Exactly. Yeah, so. I could get that, see that being touchy, but it would be interesting to see what somebody could come up with. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Really fun discussion. Yep. Now, next episode, we may have as, as much fun, uh-huh. I think, with, with this next one. We are going to jump to 1941 to talk about The Wolfman mm-hmm. with Lon Chaney Jr. And we are going to pair that with An American Werewolf in London mm-hmm. from 1981. 40 year difference, you know, span between these two films. It has been forever since I've seen an American Werewolf in London. I'm so looking forward to watching that again. Yeah, no, uh, I haven't seen that in years too. And this again, I I know I know the Wolfman story. I have seen clips. I have not sat for the whole thing, the original film. So We'll be doing this. My, I'm going out this way on almost everything till we get to the creature. <laughs> oh, and it just occurred to me too. Claude Rains will return to the show. Oh yeah, he stars in The Wolfman. Yep. No. So we get more Claude. Yay! Always, always up for more Claude Rains. All right. Well, that will do it for this episode. Thanks everyone for listening. Any comments on this episode or any of the episodes? It, prior please drop us an email at timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com or follow the link in the show notes and find where we live on all the social medias and leave your comments there that'll do it for us thanks everybody bye see ya